Good morning, everyone. So for those of you who may not know me, I'm Dr. Karen, and among other things, I do a series of uh, lectures, no strike that, let's call it discussions, where I try to relate to you the latest scientific medical information about the disease of addiction. It's a series of uh, about six lectures. And the first one today is called the functional changes of the brain in the disease of addiction. The purpose of today's lecture is going to be to try and convey to you the fact that addiction is a disease. It is not a choice. It is not really relevant to concepts like strength, willpower, ethics, and morals. And so while I frequently hear clients say that they had family members or loved ones or other people say, why can't you just stop? Why can't you just make a choice to stop doing this? We know from the scientific standpoint that that's not actually a reasonable thing. And what I want to do today is show you how once you understand how the brain functions and how the brain's functioning is so highly abnormal with the disease of addiction, I want to show you why you, that doesn't make sense. You can't expect someone to just make a choice to stop. They don't have a choice once addiction is activated. So, to start out with, I want to reinforce this concept of addiction being a disease. It's not a choice, it's not a lack in morals, ethics, willpower, or strength. It's a disease in the same way we define many other diseases, in fact, all other diseases. And we have a specific definition before we will call something a disease. We don't call just any disorder a disease, in fact. And the scientific community has three criteria that any disorder must meet before we'll call it a disease. So I just quickly want to go through the criteria we use to determine whether something really is a disease. Anyone know any of these three criteria? The first is sort of common sense in a way, but not all medical problems actually meet this. The first is that it actually has to be detrimental. It has to damage the individual, okay? Let me give you an example of an infection that's not a disease because it doesn't even meet the first criteria for something to be a disease. How many of you have children here, younger children? How many of you had younger children? Yeah, that's a lot more. Did, did your children get something called molluscum, molluscum contagiosum? Pretty common in infection. It's a viral infection. It shows up as these little, almost wart-like, fleshy little growths. And it can be anywhere on their body, all right? The nice thing is, although it freaks parents out when they see them, the nice thing is, it's a completely self-limited illness. It just goes away. It doesn't do any damage. It typically doesn't leave any scarring in and of itself, okay? But it's pretty common in kids. My three-year-old just had some uh, a couple months ago. They're gone. He's fine. So molluscum contagiosum is a virus. It's an infection, but we wouldn't label it as a disease, per se. It doesn't do anything damaging. Okay. Number two, before we'll call something a disease, we have to know the set of signs and symptoms that go along with that. In other words, we have to have seen it enough that we clearly know all the possible signs and symptoms that someone with that disease can have. Okay, we have to be able to define, okay, what does it look like? when someone has this disease? What's it look like? Let's take a, uh, another example of something that most of you are probably familiar with and would already think of as an actual disease versus just a choice or a moral or ethical lacking. How many of you heard of diabetes? Pretty common, right? Okay. What are the signs or symptoms of diabetes? Who can tell me? Any of them? High blood sugar. High blood sugar, low blood sugar, that's actually more of a, a, a test, but a sign or a symptom of high blood sugar 
That would be a sign, you're right. A symptom of high blood sugar would be what? What happens when someone's blood sugar gets really high? They, get, they start peeing really frequently, oh, yeah. polydipsia. And then they get really thirsty because they're peeing so frequently, they get dehydrated. Okay. Polyuria and polydipsia, sorry. All right. Those are signs and symptoms of diabetes. Fatigue, they get really tired as well. We could go on and on and on. There are tons of signs and symptoms of diabetes. Okay. Detrimental. How is diabetes detrimental? You lose legs and limbs. Limbs. Amputations, all right, so the diabetes, the, the, the constant long-term high blood sugars destroy the interior blood vessels and then they lose circulation. Eyesight, Eyesight diabetes is one of the leading causes of, of blindness in America still, untreated diabetes, that's correct, okay. 85% of diabetics, type 2 diabetics, will have heart attacks because of the damage to the heart vessels from the high blood sugars. Pretty clearly detrimental, okay. Let's move on to the third criteria that we use to determine whether something is a disease. The third criteria is that there must be an abnormal test that is always abnormal in people with that disease. Now by test, I mean any one of the 10,000 ad nauseum medical tests that we have. So we have thousands of blood tests that we can do. We have imaging tests, x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, PET scans. We have electrical tests, EEGs. We have sound wave tests, ultrasounds. We have, you know, could spend days talking about all the different tests we have. But before we label something as a disease, there has to be at least one of those tests that will always be abnormal in people who actually have the disease. So diabetes, the simple one, is the one that you just mentioned. You have to have an elevated blood sugar. And it either has to be over a certain number or it has to be repeatedly above a little lower number on multiple occasions. And that's an abnormal test, okay? So it's just a you know, finger stick blood sugar. How many of you have heard of fibromyalgia? Most of you. What are some of the signs and symptoms of fibromyalgia? Fatigue. Fatigue. Big. Very fatigued. What else? Pain. Pain. Trigger points. A lot of pain. What else? Insomnia is a big one. People with fibromyalgia have a lot of trouble with insomnia. Can't sleep. Okay. Uh, it's exacerbated by exercise, of all things. If you exercise when you have fibromyalgia, the symptoms often get worse. Is fibromyalgia detrimental? No. Can't prove it. I would give the opposite of that. I would say fibromyalgia is highly detrimental. Weight gain? Weight gain. Uh -huh. you, you increase your your risk for all kinds of sedentary related disorders like weight gain, high blood pressure, therefore diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's detrimental psychologically in that it has a marked increased incidence of depression. Okay. So in those ways, it's highly detrimental. What is the abnormal test? What test can we do in every person with fibromyalgia that will come up showing an abnormality? Of those 10,000 ad nauseum tests, not a single one is consistently abnormal. Even a test as simple as what's called an uh, ESR, an erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which is just a marker of inflammation in the body. It's elevated in so many disorders I couldn't possibly name them all. Even that's not reliably abnormal. We don't have a test for fibromyalgia. Therefore, it's not classified as a disease. It's a disorder, if you will. And it used to be, a decade ago, I couldn't get people their FMLA or disability for fibromyalgia because 
the government and, and employers would say, ah, these people could be malingerers, could be malingering or faking the symptoms. You can't prove they have it, like you're saying. You can't prove it. Now, don't get me wrong. I think almost all of the scientific community now believes fibromyalgia is a disease. And the problem is on our part, we're just not sophisticated enough yet to detect the abnormality. It's there, we just don't know how to detect it. And they think they've located where the problem is. It's where the nerve endings innervate the muscle fibers. But we just can't detect what that tiny, minute abnormality is that creates it. Okay? I bring that up because that's an example of something that isn't classified as a disease yet. And because of that, it was always considered to be, you know, these people are faking. Let's talk about addiction. Is addiction detrimental? Number one cause of death in 18 to 25 year olds, accidental overdose on opioids. Not to mention all the other damaging effects of addiction, which we could go on and on about, right? We talked about the liver the other night. Defined set of signs and symptoms. It is. It would take us days to cover them all. But we do know the signs and symptoms of addiction. Here's the big one. What's the abnormal test that I can do on a person with a disease of addiction? On every person with a disease of addiction? Urine screen, drug screen, blood test? Urine screen, no, because people who don't have addiction can screen positive for drugs and alcohol. That doesn't prove it. There's no blood test that will be universally abnormal in addiction. But the correct answer is, brain scan. Addiction is a disease of the brain. It is a brain-based disease. Brain scans refer to highly sophisticated imaging studies of the brain that don't look at the structure, but look at the functionality. They're different than a CAT scan. With a CAT scan, I might want to look at, you know, the, the blood vessels or, or the parenchyma, the actual brain tissue, the neurons. They don't really, we don't use brain scans for that. We use brain scans to look at the functional aspects of the brain. How's it functioning? What's happening? And what they really do is they measure things that are reflections of glucose metabolism. Because your brain cells, your neurons, can only use one energy source, glucose. It's the only thing they can use to power themselves, so they all use glucose. And the more active a brain cell is, the more glucose it uses. And we can measure, if you will, how much glucose different areas of the brain are using. So when they do brain scans, they do them from a different view than what we usually talk about. We usually talk about that side view, the sagittal, where you split my head in half. Brain scans are done from a top view. So you're looking down on the person's brain from above, with the front of the brain up here and the back of the brain down here. So like that, if you will, OK? They've done enough brain scans on people whose brains have no disease state or process, totally normal brain function, if you will, to know what a normal brain scan looks like. And the way the brain scans read is different colors reflect different levels of overall activity. And a normal brain, the human brain, normally looks somewhat like this. You guys know my artistic abilities are limited, but I'll do my best here. Dark is high activity. The darker, the higher activity, all right? And so you'll have a pattern roughly like this, OK? The gist of it being that the highest level of activity, predominantly so, in, in the human brain is up in the front here, OK, up here. That's a normal brain. 
that pattern changes consistently in people with addiction, with active addiction, to something that looks, that's supposed to be an arrow, but it doesn't really look like it, does it? Roughly like this. Front of the brain, back of the brain. Now, some of my little markings here may not be exact, but the point of it is, in addiction, this area becomes much less active at the front of the brain. And there's an area in the central part that gets much more active, increased activity. This abnormal brain scan is the key to understanding why people with addiction can't just make a choice to stop using. Willpower, ethics, morals, strength, choice, get removed from the equation. That's what we're going to spend the rest of the, this lecture, this discussion, talking about. To understand that, we have to go back to the more common view of the brain I like to use, which is that side view. So we have front of the brain, back of the brain. And we're going to have to talk about various areas of the brain and what they do. Different parts of the brain do different things. Okay? There are connections between this, these different areas. That is um, actually more like ET than a brain, isn't it? All right, let's try that again. Eh, good enough. So back here is what's called the cerebellum. This is the part of the brain that deals with fine coordination. So, you know, elite athletes, they, they've probably got a very effective cerebellum. The very back of the head, the occipital lobes, so back here, is actually where you see. Not literally, your eyes bring in the ultraviolet light information, but your brain turns that into pictures, into what you actually interpret Okay, in the very back of your head. That's where the occipital lobes, the sight lobes are, if you will. Now all across the top of your brain are conscious functions. All right, gross movement is controlled by the top parts of the brain and all your intellectual functioning. So reading, writing, arithmetic, language, philosophy, abstract thoughts, okay, Geometry, all those conscious brain functionings, the intellect, are across the top of the brain. Took this one a little too far. Now, here, in the very front of your brain, are the frontal lobes. And we'll get back to those in a second. Before we talk about the frontal lobes, I want to talk about down here, the bottom part of the brain, just above the spinal cord. It's variously referred to as the basal ganglia structures, and there are quite a few things in here. And, and a fair amount of what's in here is actually subconscious. You're not aware of what it's doing. All the things your brain are, is doing up here, you're aware. You're consciously aware of them, okay? But you have structures down here like the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is what is regulating your blood pressure right now, your pulse, your heart rate, your temperature regulation, your bowel activity, okay? And it's doing all that all the time without you ever thinking about it. In fact, you can think about it all you want and you still won't be able to control it. You'll control it in, from the subconscious part of your brain, the hypothalamus, all right? But there are lots of other structures down here. The one we want to talk about particularly today is called the nucleus accumbens clump of just brain cells. Nucleus accumbens has some uh, nicknames. Anybody know any of the nicknames for the nucleus accumbens? Pleasure center. Pleasure center. Hmm. 
reinforcement or reward center. So this is a, a clump of brain cells in your head that seems to have really only one function. That is that it will get you to repeat any behavior whose result is that it stimulates these brain cells. Anything you do that causes these brain cells to be stimulated, it will then drive you to repeat that behavior. So why would we have a part of our brain like that? Well, the thinking is that it was supposed to get you to repeat the behaviors that increase the likelihood of survival of the individual and or the species. So it's there for your good and the species good. All right. So there are certain behaviors that we know of that have always been very important to your survival and the survival of the species. All right. What, are, what am I talking about? Water. Water. What else? Procreation. Procreation. Food. Food. Sleep. Okay. Those things are what are considered salient. They are behaviors that really matter. Okay. And they really matter to your brain. They're salient to your brain. They, when you do them, your brain says, ah. They stimulate the nucleus accumbens, and then you know to repeat them, and to repeat them frequently. Food, water, sex, sleep, those kind of things, which of those four is the most important, unquestionably? Which is the most life-limiting, if you don't repeat it? Water. 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 You can only go about three days without hydrating in some form, taking in fluids, um, before you'll be dead. Okay. Which is the next most life-limiting? Food. They use the rule of threes. You got three days without water, three weeks without food. And then you get to sex and sleep. And I don't know that anyone knows which of these is more important. It's whichever you've had the least of recently, I guess. Sex, sleep. And for human brains, probably some other things develop salience, true importance. Okay? For human brains, it may be things like love or family, okay, occupation, religion, those things can actually become important enough that you're driven to repeat them. Go to church every Sunday, go to work every day, spend time with your family, okay? That's not true for lower life organisms necessarily, but social organisms have those things, wolves, social animals, okay? Let's get back now to the frontal lobes. What do the frontal lobes do? Societal behaviors. They're your socialization centers, absolutely. Your frontal lobes are the part of your brain where you learn about everything that your society, your culture believes is good versus bad, acceptable versus unacceptable, wrong versus right, and oftentimes safe versus unsafe. Your frontal lobes are the part of your brain where you learn what all of your ethics and morals are. So sometimes people want to think of ethics and morals as coming from some higher place, some higher level. It's not the case. Ethics and morals are certainly, are, are simply, excuse me, learned behaviors, learned values. And they are specific to societies and cultures. So the silly example I always use is how many of you in here now believe that it is ethical or moral to kill and eat other human beings? Now, if you were a pygmy from Papua New Guinea and belonged to one of the cannibalistic tribes, that would be perfectly ethical and moral. And in fact, it's lauded. It's the appropriate thing to do there. That's what they do. They're cannibals. Okay? Your ethics and morals are just learned values. 
And they vary from culture to culture. So when you tell someone to make a choice, it doesn't matter what the choice is about, they will use their frontal lobes to decide whether this choice versus this choice is right or wrong, good or bad, acceptable or unacceptable, and oftentimes safe versus unsafe. That's all just information contained in your frontal lobes. Okay? That's what make a choice is about. Can you do what your frontal lobes say you should do? And your brain goes through a complicated process where it uses the prefrontal cortex and the ventral tegmental area and it throws around all these different scenarios and it throws around all the different possible outcomes and then it chooses the one it thinks is the most positive outcome and then you, you do that thing. All right, that's typical brain functioning. Well, let's look at someone with the disease of addiction. By definition, we've already said the disease of addiction means the function of the brain is altered. Normal brain, most active, and therefore reasonably the most dominant area of the brain. Okay? And what do you think this area of high activity from this view, what do you think that correlates with on th this side view? In a normal human brain, it is the frontal lobes that are the most active and dominant. They're the most active part of your brain. So when someone tells you to make the right choice, you go to your frontal lobes and your cultural norms and the things you've learned, and you follow that. Makes sense, making a choice there. But look at addiction. In addiction, frontal lobes not doing so much. It's a different part of the brain that has become more active and therefore reasonably more dominant. Because it's been habitually, meaning repetitively, 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 massively overstimulated. That's the key. Mood altering substances, drugs and alcohol, scientists have identified 30 million substances on the planet that affect the brain. And of those 30 million, less than 100 of them are classified as having the potential to cause the disease of addiction. Incredibly rare, tiny fraction of the total number that do this. But the one thing that mood altering substances, drugs and alcohol have in common is that they all massively over stimulate to an abnormal degree the reinforcement center. The part of your brain that is there to get you to do one thing, and that is repeat whatever behavior stimulates it the most. And they do it to a far greater degree, higher intensity and longer duration than any of the naturally salient stimulators of the reinforcement center. They're way up here, mood altering substances. But remember, your reward center, your reinforcement center, your pleasure center, it doesn't know that that's abnormal or it doesn't know that it's bad. It just is there to get you to repeat whatever behavior stimulates it. That's why they say mood altering substances hijack the human brain. They're going to affect the part of your brain that is supposed to drive you to repeat whatever stimulates it. And they stimulate it way more than even water, the most life-limiting thing on the planet for human beings. Way more. So let's, here's the analogy I use. If I go to the gym and every day all I do are curls, that's it, don't do any other exercise. What happens? Well, my bicep gets very strong. Okay, but none of the other muscles of my upper arm and shoulder and lower arm and stuff get as strong because I'm just doing curls, just stimulating that one part. Well, when my bicep gets hugely strong and I look like Popeye and the rest of the, all the musculature doesn't, what's going to happen? The fact that my bicep is now disproportionately dominant, it'll change how my arm even functions. 
It'll change the functional way my arm operates. When this part of your brain, this relatively primitive, in many ways partially subconscious part of your brain, has been repeatedly overstimulated, it doesn't get bigger like my muscle, okay, but it be does become more active and potentially more dominant. And therefore, in terms of I have a decision to make now about whether I'm going to continue the use of my mood altering substance, despite the fact that I know it's the wrong thing to do, it's the unacceptable thing to do, and it's the unsafe thing to do. Which part of the brain is going to win the battle? Well, the part that's more active and more dominant. It's not like people with addiction don't know they shouldn't keep doing it. It's also not like people with active addiction don't want to stop. Because want to stop comes from the conscious part of the brain. Everybody with this disease wants to stop. It has terrible consequences. It makes your lives a disaster. And how many of you can remember thinking, I have to stop. I can't use again. This is the last time. I'm not getting more. And the next thing you knew, you were walking out the door to go get more. And it didn't make sense to you. It's like, why can't I stop this? Well, you can't stop it because you didn't understand that the functional structure of your brain had been altered in a way that you didn't get to make what you consider and what society considers a choice anymore. Your addicted brain, the limbic system, it couldn't care less about right versus wrong, good versus bad, safe versus unsafe, and acceptable versus unacceptable. It doesn't even deal with that kind of information. And if your frontal lobes are being overruled, it's the, the, the addiction center that is now pulling the strings on the marionette, even while you are consciously saying, I don't want this anymore. You can literally get up, walk out the door, and go do it again. Does that make sense? Can any of you identify with having that exact thing happen to you while your disease was active? Now, this brings about some important things that we need to discuss. This means that for people with active addiction, which by definition means that this is their brain functioning, they can't just make the choice to stop using which many of you family members have seen. You've witnessed that very phenomenon. Might have not made sense to you at the time, but you did witness the phenomenon. This is why it takes external factors, external controls, if you will, for people to have a, a chance of getting this disease into remission. And for the vast majority, that is true. That's why we recommend coming into a formal treatment center. So that you don't have to make a choice you can't make because that part of your brain isn't in control. It gets made for you. Now here's something that's important to understand too. Does this abnormal brain scan ever go back to normal? Or are you stuck with this for life? So it does have the potential to go back to a normal brain scan. And they've done some studies on this, not, not a tremendous volume but, uh, or number of, of people that they've done it on because th these brain scans are uh, ridiculously expensive. But they have done some. How long if someone maintains abstinence, no more overstimulation, no more massive overstimulation of the, the pleasure centers, how long does it take for the brain scan to go back to normal. Nine months to a year? The nine months is the repair of, of the tolerance, uh, physical abnormalities. It's more like about maybe a year, but they say one to five years is the possibility. Yeah. Uh, it can take one to five years for that brain scan to go back to normal, but it can go back to normal. That's important, right? Because for me, that's what getting your disease into remission, remission means. I don't consider a disease in remission until the brain scan goes back to normal. But it happens. 
you can maintain sobriety long enough, and you can keep from overactivating your limbic system, your addicted pathways. You can get back to your frontal lobes being the most active and dominant part of your brain, and then you do get to make a choice by what you think of as a choice. That's the good news. The bad news is it's actually quite hard to calm this area down. That's why we spend so much time teaching you ways of having new behaviors and thoughts that get around the old pathways that involve the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the nucleus accumbens, memories, emotions, and pleasure. Because every time you're activating those with your old thoughts and behaviors, you're keeping this part of the brain more active and therefore potentially dominant over your frontal lobes. Treating addiction is very difficult because it requires human beings to develop new behaviors. Behavior modification. We are not particularly good at that as human beings. The classic other example is obesity. There may be all kinds of underlying reasons for obesity. But when you break obesity down to its simplest terms, it has to do with someone taking in more calories than they burn off every day. It's simple physics. If you can burn off more calories than you take in every day, you must lose weight. Energy versus mass. Einstein proved this a long time ago. And yet, our our ability to treat obesity is horrible. In fact, the only thing we found that's really effective for changing a person's behavior, because if you just ask them to eat less and exercise more, they, they can't do it. They can't change the behaviors. So what do we rev revert to? Well, we reverted to a massively intrusive surgery where we make it so they can't. They don't have a choice. They're not making the decision. We make their stomachs so small and take away part of their intestines that they can't take in more calories than they burn off, and then they lose weight. Okay, the gastric bypass surgeries that are so common now. Because right. people can't change their behaviors. It's really hard for people to change behaviors. And that's why in addiction, we spend so much time teaching you ways to change your behaviors, to develop new electrical pathways that don't activate the part of your brain that you need to get calmed down and let your frontal lobes get more active again. Good news is it can happen, one five years. Bad news is the next time you start overstimulating the pleasure center, it doesn't gradually gain control again. It seems to just boom. The monster explodes and it will gain control again way more quickly than it did the first time. Relapse is very dangerous particularly late relapse. Because you think you got some time. You think you can have, oh, I'll just have one drink and I won't go back to drinking 24 beers a day. And the first time, it might have taken years for you to get to 24 beers a day. But when you relapse, people get back to the dose they left off with in days to weeks. Because you lose control really quickly that second time around. This seems to occur much faster. Yes, ma'am. You might have said this. Um, what happens if you change your drug of choice? Doesn't much matter. You change your drug of choice, all the mood altering substances overstimulate that part of the brain by probably orders of magnitude greater than the naturally salient things out there. You change your drug of choice, you're still going to go this way remarkably fast once you've already had the disease of addiction in an active form. And that's what so many people do. Well, yeah, alcohol was a disaster, but I can use some cocaine, that won't be a problem. And what really happens is what we call the phenomenon of cross addiction, where as soon as you start to lose control, <laughs> you just go back to your drug of choice, because that's what it wants. It wants the one that it liked the most. So cross addiction usually just you start using another substance, but you end up back with your substance of choice anyway, because you don't have any control at that point. 
good question. Yes, sir. The, um, your drug of choice, does it overtake some of the, the, the need for the water, the food, the, the sleep? Stuff like that? It, Certainly. Is that because that stimulates more, is yeah. there less? Absolutely. Needed? Yeah, yeah, unquestionably. I, I don't think I've seen a person addicted to opiates um, who's come in ever that wasn't dehydrated. Just didn't matter as much to their brains. Yeah. And, and then, you know, just the behaviors that are associated with death, obviously you're losing your ability to choose safe versus unsafe. You're losing it. Your frontal lobes are being out, outruled. Any other questions? Does this make sense to everyone? Okay, thanks everyone. Thank We're done for the morning. Thank you.